Kentucky Ag Today. We appreciate everybody joining us this Thursday morning, April the 23rd. I uh, hope all are doing well. Um, we're thankful to have many great guest uh, speakers and specialists with us this morning. So this is just a great opportunity for, for folks within Extension, uh, producers in the field, uh, anyone that's, that's interested or participating in the livestock industry right now. Um, so, uh, so I think we'll I think get we'll started get this morning and uh, I'll ask uh, several of the speakers that we have joining us. Um, we'll just kind of start one by one and, and ask you all to kind of introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, and, and if you have any comments or updates that you would like to share with us, we'll, we'll allow our guest speakers to provide those comments first this morning. Uh, and then when we finish with that, uh, we'll open it up at the end for a question and answer session uh, for all of the participants that are joining us and, and hopefully we'll get a good uh, good discussion going this morning and answer a lot of people's questions uh, as, as how COVID-19 is uh, impacting our livestock industry. So uh, that's the topic this morning, impacts of COVID-19 on the livestock industry. So I guess we'll first start off with uh, our specialist this morning from the University of Tennessee. We're, we're Pleased to be joined by Dr. Andrew Griffith and Dr. Charlie Martinez. So good morning, Dr. Griffith and Dr. Martinez. Uh, we'll, we'll start with you two if, if that's okay. Are you just wanting us to introduce ourselves or, or go ahead and start talking about cattle stuff? Y yes, sir. If, if, uh, if you and Dr. Martinez could just provide us a few comments, um, uh, what, what you do, um, just introduce yourself a little bit and then you could go ahead with your presentation. And then when we finish with the University of Tennessee presentation, we'll move forward to, to our specialist at VDAX and uh, Virginia Tech, if, if that's okay. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Andrew Griffith. Uh, I'm a livestock extension economist at the University of Tennessee. I've uh, been there since 2012, and uh, just, uh, I guess I was hired to primarily do marketing, but do a lot of production and, and forage work, and have worked quite a bit with uh, uh, Scott Griner there at Virginia Tech and Victor Mercandante uh, from, from a extension standpoint, do some work with uh, some agents in Southwest Virginia on an annual basis with our Tri-State Beef Conference. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of what I do. And I'm uh, Charlie Martinez. Uh, been with University of Tennessee for a whopping, what day is it? April 23rd, so almost a whopping four months. Uh, I'm the farm and financial management specialist uh, with our ag econ department. Uh, I grew up in Texas, and so uh, coming to Tennessee and, and getting living here for roughly four or five months now. It's been a crazy time uh, to be here on the, on the eastern side of the United States. And uh, growing up as a cow kid myself, uh, you know, it's, this is all becoming, uh, it's been interesting. And uh, I'm happy to be here and happy to help you all today. Thank, thank well, you all both for joining us. Yes, sir. We're, we're glad to be able to do it and, and help out in whatever way we can. We're here. I mean, we're, we're here to serve. Um, but I guess I'll start off and, and uh, Charlie can, uh, uh, can fill in some gaps if I leave them. But uh, we're, you know, based off of what y'all asked us to, to talk about and, and uh, discuss, you know, we have producers in Tennessee that are facing the same issues um and now granted you know when you get when you get on the eastern coast you get into some hog country over there and that, and that's it can be even worse for those hog producers but from the cattle standpoint we've got a lot of people that are trying to market uh fall born calves this time of year pulling them off the cow taking them to market trying to hit that grass market and uh we we realize that prices are depressed tremendously you know, in some cases, we've lost uh, fifteen, twenty dollars a hundred weight on some of these, on some of these calves. And um, uh, don't don't uh, misunderstand anything that I say. I'm I'm in the same boat with those people that are owning cattle and lost value in cattle because I've got about two loads of stocker cattle out on pasture right now that, um, you know, that they they're worth about what I bought paid for them right now, uh, and, and that doesn't count my input. So. Um, you know, when you think of it from that standpoint, I, I feel the, the, the pain that 
people are, you know, it's, it's mainly psychological if you don't have to market right now. Uh, it won't be experienced until you actually have to market those animals. Um, but there, there's a lot of psychological impact that that can, that can have on producers uh, thinking ahead that if this market doesn't improve, uh, what, what could it be? Uh, you know, how, how big of a hit are, are these operations going to take? And, and that's a small operation or a large operation, either one. But uh, we, uh, I'm going to throw a plug in for uh, Charlie's Crops, Cattle, and Charlie video series that we've started doing. Um, and it addresses some of these topics uh, that 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 we're I'm going to mention today. And it might they're just three to five minute videos that if y'all want to uh, pass that along to agents. I mean, a lot of y'all are going to be agents in in certain counties, but uh, you know, pass it on uh, farther throughout the state. Um, but it, we address several issues related to COVID nineteen, and. Uh, you know, the, the main thing is, is from a cattle, a, a cow calf producer, a stocker producer standpoint, which is what most people, I guess most people in Eastern Virginia are going to be cow calf producers, but I, I know there'll be some stocker producers there as well. But if you have to market in, in today's market, I mean, if you, if, if you feel like this is when you have to market, uh, you know, maybe you just have to go ahead and cut your losses and, and send the cattle on down the road. Um, if, if that is, if your local auction market is even operating, um, in Tennessee, we, we have not had any of our regular markets stop operations. We have had a few in Northern Alabama that have uh, shut down for a couple of weeks. Um, but, but, you know, the, the alternatives, and I think this is a year for those people that have never preconditioned any cattle, uh, have never retained ownership of cattle, this may be the year to try that because if you feel like, if you're saying, you, you, you know, I always market in March, April, or May, and and these markets are as depressed as they are, you know you're going to take some lumps. And if you're fine with taking those lumps and you can handle those lumps this year, well, then go on about your business. But I'm the type of person that wants to extend my marketing window as far as possible. As, as, long, as, I can, as long as I can extend it, that's what I would want to do. And so that may be, you know, putting these calves into the, the preconditioning phase. I don't think that 45 days of preconditioning is going to help this market a whole lot. You're probably looking at closer to 90 days. Um, and then you have to evaluate if you have those resources uh, to do that. Um, if, if 90 days and the market still happening has not done what you want it to do, uh, you know, there's always that opportunity to put them in the feedlot. Uh, I know there's been a lot of media that says, you know, feedlots are full and uh, you can't find pen space, but I know there is pen space out there. Uh, these feedlots weren't, now the Texas feedlots may be full, uh, but uh, uh, the northern feedlots, as soon as this weather starts to turn around, they'll be wanting to put cattle in some of those yards, and that's something to think about. Charlie, uh, you have, oh, have anything to add or go uh, talk about? I think, I think you did a good job for the feeder cattle side. I think uh, one of the first answers that was to try to get through all this, if you were a cow calf producer, was if you need the cash flow and you want to hang on to the calves, then get rid of, of the cows and cull a little harder. And I think that market's starting to give up a little bit, and not have as much steam in it now. And so, from the cow calf side, if you if you cold there, the next question is where can I get some cash flow or how can I manage the risk a little bit better? And I think you you highlighted some opportunities there, some strategies to take. Uh, but also from a just from a financial side. Um, you know, Dr. or uh, Tony Purdue came out last week, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this group chat has probably seen <clears throat> that they've talked about having some kind of, you know, payment program for cow calf producers. And uh, at this time, you know, no one really knows uh, how or you know that what kind of what kind of method they're going to use in order to get this money out to to cow calf producers, particularly, and then also um, who is going to be eligible besides that to get money. And so I would recommend to producers also um, to kind of watch out for that and, and try to maintain a, a good relationship with it, whether what, what I would anticipate is probably going to be your FSA office. And so your local FSA office. And so I would probably anticipate that that's where you're probably going to have to uh, have a, a, a good relationship is going to be beneficial for you as a producer. Um, but that, that's one program that if I'm a producer, I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch and see because that should be able to help also with, you know, 
a cash flow uh, type of situation. Um, but moving forward into the future right now, I think uh, you did a great job of, of highlighting, you know, the uncertainty. I know some other folks are, are saying, okay, well, if I got to get rid of, of stalkers or if I got to get rid of these heavy bull calves or steers, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I'm going to retain the females and try to replace and, and try to grow them up to be replacements for somebody later down the line and shifting that risk a little bit further down uh, the window. Maybe I sell them as a bread or sell them as a cow calf pair down the line instead of trying to sell right now, hoping that, they, that people can capture some kind of value on them at the end. Uh, but, you know, I think you did a good job um, for the for the feeder calf side. You know, Charlie, Charlie reminded me of the cash flow and, and culling situation. Um, I don't know. I, I don't. I haven't looked at uh, Virginia cull cow and slaughter bull prices. Um, but uh, we we had a strong start to the year for cull cows and slaughter bull prices. And and that market's a little different than uh, the 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 finished cattle market. And since the start of this coronavirus, stay at home orders. And y'all are much y'all are much closer to it than we are. We're we're pretty glad to be away from the D.C. area. Um, <laughs> the farther away you can get, the better sometimes. Um, but uh, uh, we we've had we, we only had a couple of down weeks. There was a, a short time period where uh, cull cows and slaughter bulls um, prices declined, and th this really would be a time that. Uh, you know, it think, I'm thinking about these freshly weaned calves or you still have stocker cattle and maybe you have cows as well and you're worried about your, your forage resources and who should you keep and who should you not keep. Uh, I think that, I mean, this would be a good time to cull deep into that herd um, from, a, from an economic standpoint. I mean, it probably is from an animal science standpoint too. You know, Scott probably could talk more to that. Scott Griner could, but uh, but from an economic standpoint, this would be a good year to cull deep into those 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 cows. I mean, even cull some cows that you might think you generally wouldn't cull a, a, another year or two from now, um, because it may it may benefit you even more to keep back some of those some more of those heifers because they're so undervalued right now, and you go ahead and develop some more heifers to go back into the breeding herd to replace those cull cows because those cull cows are at a strong value those heifers are at a very low value relative to what I think they should be. And so you're essentially getting to develop a heifer at a, at a pretty inexpensive price. I mean, because whatever she's worth is what essentially you're saying you're willing to pay for her to put her into the, into the herd. And, and I mean, I saw some, well, I bid on some cattle this week. Uh, you know, you get a, a, a ready to breed heifer, um, they were going for 98 cents and we're talking about good ready to breed 800 pound uh heifers uh, you know that, i mean that's that's hard to that, that's hard to beat that's a pretty cheap heifer that's ready to breed um and so even if you have 500 pound heifers right now they're not worth much uh keep them call deep get your cash flow from your from your coal cows uh that that'll help pay for fertilizer that'll help for to pay for you know the diesel filling up the diesel tank um, whatever it is you need during the hay time, uh, uh, you know, those are, you know, those are things that, that I know people have, are thinking about right now. You know, I think about some of these guys that are preconditioning. You say, well, where, where am I, if you're going to precondition, where do I get the cash to, to buy feed? Well, the cull cows may be that, that option. At the same time, when you pull those cull cows off and you keep those calves to precondition, you have the forwards that the cull cows would have normally, uh, consumed. So that, that's another, that's another thought uh there all right Th thank you dr griffith and dr martinez we appreciate those comments and uh we'll we'll hold some questions if you have questions for for the folks from tennessee towards the end but we really appreciate that's that's great information and uh i hope that answers some questions for some folks so now we'll move forward. Uh, we've got Mike Carpenter and, and Morgan Croft from the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So uh, Mike and Morgan, if, if y'all would like to go ahead and just briefly introduce yourselves this morning and uh, provide some comments, we appreciate y'all joining us. Sure. Uh, this is Mike Carpenter with Livestock Marketing, Virginia Department of Agriculture. 
Uh, we provide uh, grading services for all the graded feeder cattle sales we have here in Virginia. We also conduct uh, market development activities promoting Virginia cattle to feedlots all across the country. And we also collect the market news reports uh, here in Virginia. We collect the reports and forward those to our market news section. Uh, just to check, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, okay. Mike, you well. Good, okay. All right, so um, I'll touch on some, uh, just some national issues going on right now, updates, and then Morgan Croft will uh, give an update on some more of the uh, prices here in Virginia. So as far as livestock market closings here in Virginia, Winchester closed for two weeks and they reopened uh, Monday, three days ago. Uh, Abingdon closed for one week, the week of uh, Easter, uh, and they've reopened. So they are the only market closings that we have had here in Virginia. Uh, and to varying degrees, the markets are doing their best to, uh, you know, keep crowds at a minimum. Uh, I was even advised that uh, before Winchester shut down, they had a couple guys come in there and just lingering. Uh, that's a very social atmosphere at Winchester. And um, they asked, them, asked the guys to leave, and they did. But they came back that afternoon just to watch the sale. So you have some things going on with certain uh, groups of people that that is their social outing for the week. Uh, and that's been taken away from them for a little bit. So, um, But they'll work through it and get over it, and we'll get to the other side of it. So um, back to some updates. Uh, we have a really interesting dynamic going on in the beef cattle industry. We've got beef cutouts reaching almost record levels. Yesterday, the choice beef cutout was 275, and we've got live cattle prices going down. And I was reading one analyst uh, view of it to, to, to look at it like this. It's like an hourglass effect. On one side of the hourglass, uh, you've got the numbers of cattle that are ready to kill. Uh, the narrow bottleneck of the hourglass are the processing facilities. And on the other side, you've got this anticipated demand uh, at retail level, not, at, not from restaurants, but at retail level um, for demand for the product. So it's really interesting uh, and talk about that small part of the hourglass, that bottleneck, that's really becoming a concern because last week cattle slaughter was down 22% from last year. And so far this week, the numbers are trending even lower. So that is, uh, has, when we started first talking about the, the effects of COVID, we were concerned that, you know, what would happen if it, got into the communities that work in the processing plants and it's happening. You know, we've seen JBS in Pennsylvania closed for two weeks. They've now reopened. Uh, Tama, Iowa was closed and now, now they've reopened. The uh, JBS plant in Greeley, Colorado is now closed. Um, you know, another, other plants have cut back on shifts or reduced uh, levels of kill to accommodate some of the social distancing, which is very difficult to do in the slaughter plants. So it will be interesting to see where all this shakes out with this increasing box beef values and lower slaughter cattle prices. Um, what I think is going to happen, I think we may continue to see what I'll term as rolling closures in some of these processing plants. You know, you've got a plant that may be closed for anywhere from three days to two weeks and then they'll reopen and you know another plant will be closed for a while and and it will reopen so that's until that uh ceases until we work through that there's going to be this continued bottleneck at the processing and it's going on at hogs too you know we've heard about sioux falls south dakota smithfield plant and a a JBS plan in, in Minnesota, and there's probably others that I don't know about, but um, that's going to be the unknown or the concern with getting all these animals slaughtered and into the process, into the meat uh, distribution chain, if you will. 
Um, I was on a, uh, listened to a webinar last week and it echoed Dr. Griffith's comments about holding lighter cattle. You know, we here in Virginia, we wish people would hold cattle heavier than they do. And this is the time to do it, add weight to them. If you've got the grass, if you've got the forage, if you've got the uh, capability to hold on those, to those light cattle, uh, I agree with Dr. Griffith that now is the time to do it. Um, I think that's it for me. I'll let Morgan go ahead with some of his comments. Hi, I'm Morgan Croft. Uh, I work with uh, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Livestock Marketing under Mike, uh, kind of cover Central Virginia and through the Piedmont there. Just kind of touching back on Virginia's markets, I dug back and looked in January, and you know, our five weight steers in January were trading for 145 to 170 for the for the wean calves getting up there to 170. And last week and even into this week, if it wasn't for the grass push, you know, we would really be bottomed out. But our five weight steers are still trading for 145 and 170 because of the grass push. So the the biggest hit in Virginia I see for our feeder cattle are the guys that are backgrounding them and preconditioning them and have these eight and nine weight cattle right now that they're forced to sell. I mean, Virginia, we we finish very few cattle, so we, we've got to unload them and ship them west or ship them north of Pennsylvania. Our eight and nine weight cattle are worth a buck thirty to a dollar forty in January. They're worth a dollar to a dollar fifteen today. You know, you're taking ten to twenty thousand dollars off a load of cattle. These producers are getting hammered and they're forced to sell them. I mean it's they can't make them any bigger because a thousand pound steer in Virginia in June would be a nightmare. So that's the biggest impact I see in Virginia's producers is the guys that have backgrounded them all winter and uh, they've got these spring born calves or fall well, let's see they're spring born calves that they've backgrounded all winter and now they're eight and nine weights. Um, touching back on the coal cows it's kind of, Mike was talking about these rolling closures in the markets. You know, two weeks ago, our cold cows were up there 50 to 70. And uh, it was just a supply and demand kind of deal when Browns got full and had a large inventory. The following week, our cold cows went down to 40. I mean, they take 10, $15 off the cows overnight. And it's just in the closures of the market, the closures of the kill plants. But our slaughter bulls are holding steady. I mean, they're 85 to a dollar. Um, these guys are selling some pound pound cows at record numbers, um, but if they miss out on a closure of a plant, they can take them to town thinking they're going to do something and they get hammered because the plants are shut down and the inventory stacked up for the week and, you know, they, they missed out on a great opportunity. So I encourage the producers to stay vigilant in the news and pay attention to these mark, to the slaughterhouses that are open and closed and, uh, they can take advantage of the market that way. Mike, you want to touch on anything else? I think we're good. All right, Mike, Morgan, thank y'all for joining us this morning. We appreciate those comments and, and y'all taking some time to be with us this morning. It's much appreciated. Uh, Scott, I, I guess we'll move forward to Dr. Scott Griner from uh, Virginia Tech, Virginia Cooperative Extension. If, if you've got some comments you'd like to share this morning. Oh, I'm not sure I do. Uh, thank you all for your comments and um, encourage everybody to ask questions. Um, I guess I'd just maybe uh, give a little shout out and appreciate um, this session being held and, and just so everybody knows and I think they know we're gonna we're gonna start a, a bi-weekly deal on Fridays at noon and some of the things we'll be talking about tomorrow I think will follow up nicely with some of the discussion that's already happened today. Um, I guess I'd ask, and I apologize, um, quite honestly, I'm multitasking. I have a class that meets from 8 to 9.15, so I had that on one Zoom on one computer, and I had this one pulled up on the other. Fortunately, I wasn't lecturing. I was just uh, um, helping manage that through a guest lecture, so I missed a little of the front end. Um, Mike or Morgan, uh, um, I don't know if you touched at all. I, I heard the comments on the cattle market. Mike, can you touch on the small ruminant side? I know one of the challenges that we're facing out here in East is um, some lack of reporting, particularly coming out of New Holland, which drives our sheep market largely, or certainly is a price um, 
from a trading standpoint, that establishes value largely. Can you comment at all on that or have any thoughts? Sure, Ken. Uh, first to the uh, uh, not reporting of the New Holland market, um, USDA Market News made the decision not to send their personnel in there because uh, if you haven't been to New Holland, uh, there it's a very closed atmosphere. Uh, it's hard to stay away from people. And there are buyers and people coming in there from New York, New Jersey, which has had you know incredible number of cases that we know of. So because of concern for their employees, they chose not to report that market for the time being. Uh, you know, the market's still operating. They are now reporting numbers. I looked yesterday, they, they're reporting numbers, but no prices. So the other thing, going back to the small ruminant side, uh, three weeks ago, uh, as we were approaching Easter, there was a lot of concern about, you know, would there be any demand for product at Easter time? And the week before Easter, you know, New Holland, through some other sources, Prices had gotten fairly cheap. You know, some lambs on the front end of the sale were bringing two to two fifty, but we heard that by the end of the sale they were down to a dollar fifty. So, just as an example, we were getting ready to have a the special lamb sale at Madison. Uh, we checked with those local buyers, and they were needing some lambs. So we proceeded with that sale, and the prices were a uh, dollar eighty to two dollars. Uh, now that we've overcome some of that fear factor, uh, we've seen some reports recently that lambs are bringing two to 240. So the market has recovered some, uh, not quite to where it was, but uh, I was very relieved to see that um, some demand has come back into the market uh, from you know, here in the East, from primarily those ethnic communities who you know, have a family gathering or a social gathering to uh, celebrate and uh, utilize those goat or sheep whole carcasses for an event. So um, anyway, it's, it's better than it was looking like three weeks ago. We'll say that. What, what weight class of lambs was that? That would have been primarily 80 to 100 pound lambs, although in New Holland, you get a lot down to 60. But uh, for example, at Madison, that was 80 to 100, well, let's say 60 to 90 pound lambs predominantly. Heavier okay. lambs, heavier lambs will be cheaper than that. You know, 120 yes, to 140 pound lambs, realistically, you're looking at probably a dollar fifty or less, depending on the situation. That's the thing. It's Right now, it can be hit or miss, not only in, in lambs and goats, but also cattle. It can be somewhat hit or miss depending on your situation where you are. That's why we have recommended, and it's on our website now, that you know if you have any questions at all, call ahead to the market where you are planning to sell some of your livestock and get the most up-to-date information that you can. All right. Well, th thank you, Scott. We appreciate that that update and appreciate you joining us this morning uh, to to answer some questions if folks have questions. So uh, thanks again to to all of our speakers this morning. We appreciate that. Um, I guess now we'll move forward to to kind of the question and answer portion of this. Um, hopefully, facilitate a good discussion for folks. Um, if you have a question and you're joining us via a, a laptop or a computer. Um, if you want to just type that in the chat window, uh, we'll be monitoring that and I'm going to start at the top and just kind of roll through those and, and just ask those to our panel of speakers and uh, whoever feels feels like they want to answer it or, or can provide comments can certainly do so for that. But um, once we do that, uh, if we don't have any more in the chat window, we'll open up the, the floor and unmute folks um, to ask those questions if they have questions. So. Uh, I see we've got a couple of questions in the chat box. The first question uh, would be, do we cut back on all callable cows, even if we do not have replacement heifers to fill their position? So uh, maybe Dr. Griffith, I know you touched on that topic a little bit. Any comments on that? Uh, you know, if, 
even if you don't have any girl to replace the old one, I, I think it's all right to go ahead and, and cull those animals. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, in, in the Southeast, well, uh, even when I spent my time in Oklahoma, and I'm sure Charlie can speak for Texas, there's a lot of people that have a lot of cows that should have been culled that have never been culled anyway. And we could cull pretty deep and we'd still be getting rid of cows that need to be culled. Um, but, but the thing is, is for, from a cash flow standpoint, even if you don't have uh, enough heifers to replace all the cows that you might cull, you might need to sell that many cows to get the cash flow that you need uh, for this time of year. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's just no reason to hold on to an animal that, uh, that, that should be culled. And, and at this time, with the value that a lot of those animals do have, um, yeah, you know, a lot of these slaughter facilities for, for coiled cows are a lot smaller than uh, what we see for fed cattle processing. Um, and, and we hadn't seen as big impact, but uh, Mr. Carpenter spoke to that a few minutes ago that there are, you know, if, you, if you've got a full, full line that week, they're, they're going to push prices down. But I would say go ahead and call them. All right, thank you, Dr. Griffith. We appreciate that. Uh, the, the next question that we had was for feed, what do you all see the impacts on feed costs being as some of the breweries and feed mills are shutting down? And I see, I see Dr. Griner has provided a uh, webinar series link there as well in the chat box, but uh, can, can any of you comment on that question about feed? Charlie, would you like to start on that? Well, <clears throat> The, 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 the other, the, we do feed a lot of DDGs and, and going back even to the panhandle, they feed a lot of DDGs and stuff of that nature. Uh, and, but the counter to that has always been corn. Well, corn is probably going to be pretty, pretty cheap this coming year. And so uh, feed costs from that standpoint should stay relatively low, even though we have, you know, that, that the, the, the mills closing and then the breweries closing and stuff of that nature because of the, because of corn. Um, so I, I would anticipate feeding costs being relatively low. Well, um, I, I think, I think it's going to take, uh, just, just, just purchase some feed this week, actually. Uh, and, uh, prices had gone up on feed and I, I was kind of surprised from that standpoint because I think it, I think Charlie is right. You know, we used to just feed corn, you know, corn used to be the, the main feed stuff. Right. And then we started using byproducts of corn uh, because we could get a higher value out of that, out of that corn product because we could, we could separate the energy and the protein and the energy could go to ethanol production or, or we'll call it spirits uh, because the question is actually on <laughs> breweries and, and, and things of, the, of that nature. And so, you know, but we we do we 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 know how to feed corn, but it almost it seems as if uh, the people mixing these these feed rations have forgot how to mix corn and how to balance a ration with just corn. Um, you know, it's high in energy. It's got about eight percent protein um, instead of turning it into DDGs. At the same time, we've seen uh, uh, some of these facilities that make uh, corn syrup. You know, when you get corn gluten feed. Uh, the availability of some of that feed is, is, has slowed down. And, and so you would think that there should be plenty of corn on the market at a fair, cheap enough price. And, and at the same time, we, shouldn't, we probably shouldn't be looking at, at maximizing growth in these cattle. So we probably ought not be pushing these cattle. Uh, you know, we've got people that are strictly feeding uh, stocker cattle in essentially like a feedlot situation. Um, there's no reason to push these cattle trying to get them two, two and a half to three pounds a day. Uh, because what we've already talked about those heavier weight cattle. I mean, there's nowhere to go with them. Um, no reason to push them hard. So no reason to put a whole lot of money into that, into that feed other than uh, if that's the only method you use and I would still slow them down. The benefit of here in the East coast is that grass is, we got grass here. Uh, Plentiful. This year. So that's that's going to be one of the the aces in our hole. The aces in the hole for us on this side is we got grass and this that's a cheap way of putting on cheap pounds. 
All right, the, the next question we've got here is, uh, how do I find prices for grazing fees in Southwest Virginia? Um, anybody can answer that for us? I don't know. I don't know of a. I don't know if any specific Virginia one, but Kentucky just finished up their custom rates uh, survey too. So um, that would be the closest thing I know of. I don't know if Andrew, if you know of another one. Um, you know, this is a common question that we get in Tennessee, and well, I get it from other states as well. Um, there is a, a nice resource. Uh, is it uh, oh, Ag Lease 101? I think it's aglease101.com or .gov or something like that. And I think it has some resources that uh, you could uh, use to help people develop what their grazing fees are. I, you know, this it's, it's unique. I, I'll give you an example. Uh, last year, I was renting pasture ground, and at the same, so I was I was leasing ground from from a from a neighbor, and at the same time, I was renting some of my ground to a different neighbor. Uh, so I was had money going out and money going in, and those were actually they were structured totally different um, because of who was doing what management. Uh, essentially, I was doing management on all of the, the pasture. And so it's hard, you know, to, to have a, even if you had a publication where you surveyed people and what, what their grazing fees were, not knowing all the specifics of how things are, you know, who provided the, who provided the fertilizer, who provided the chemical application, who is keep up keeping the fences, um, who's taking care of the watering systems, uh, all those impact what those grazing fees actually should be. And if they should be on a rental rate or if they should be on a, a dollar per head per day or if they should be on a gain basis um, or who, who's even providing the management to the cattle. Uh, so that, uh, that, that came from uh, Ms. Harris and, and that's, just, that's a tough question and, and there's really not a, a good set of information in, in any state that I, I'm familiar with that, that outlines all that but the ag lease 101 oh there uh miss uh miss roberts put that up there thank you um you know that kind of guides you through how you could develop help help work with producers to to set grazing fees yeah for, for thank you for that andrew we appreciate it uh becky shared the link there in the uh in the chat box ag lease 101.org so that may be a good place to start looking for some of those as, as well as uh charlie's comments on the university of kentucky survey um the the next question that we've got here is do we have an idea of what the cares act is going to look like for farmers especially the stocker operations I, I'm laughing because that's 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 been a hot topic for me personally and, and what trying to keep up with stuff for our state. I'll take a, a stab at it and Andrew fill in if, if you hear something that, that I forget. Uh, currently, right now, as we speak, there's there's bills being passed that are going to help, uh, so, you know, with the second phase of funding for the programs that came from the CARES Act that our producers could use. So those the programs that I'm referencing are the PPP in the EIDL program. Uh, currently, the PPP program was the one that was the, the more commonly talked about one for small businesses that uh, people could apply for, get a low interest rate, and uh, that was mainly used for payroll type things, and there were very specific things that you could use it for. Um, and that money ran out as fast as it came in, it feels like. Um, but they're talking about currently right now trying to get more funds for the PPP program and that's where people uh, like stock operators can go find some help. Um, there's another one, the EIDL or, or the IDLE one, uh, but uh, you know it, that one has an interest rate of 3.75 and uh, I would say it's kind of a, you analyze your situation and see if that's acceptable for you because as an operator, there's probably other areas that we can find a lower interest rate and always trying to get that, get a lower interest rate is always, you know, the best, best, oppor best opportunity for us as producers. 
um, and a shameless plug, actually this morning, uh, we actually released a video on the PPP and EIDL programs, a quick uh, video, I think it's like four minutes long, uh, in the link that I provided earlier. Uh, but right now, as it currently stands, the, the, what an operator can do right now is you have the EIDL program or uh, some kind of FSA loan or something of that nature, but be watching the PPP program uh, if more funds become available. And uh, you know, as soon as that hits and the policies that go along with it, I'll be writing up stuff on it as fast as I can. All right, thank you, Charlie. We, we appreciate that. I uh, see we've got another comment here bouncing back to the feed question. We had earlier uh, a comment from Brad that says, in addition to corn, there will be a lot of small grain available for feed locally, barley and small grain baleage as well. So those are just some other feed options that producers may be able to look at uh, in, in the coming weeks here. So thanks, Brad. Appreciate that comment. Uh, in, any other questions from anyone at this time? I, I don't see anything else in the chat box. So um, if, if you've got a question and you have the, the capacity to put it in the chat box, um, you can go ahead and do that. But if we don't have any other questions from the chat box, we can open it up to the, to the floor. I know we've got some folks joining us via, via telephone line and also, um, I, I guess we'll go ahead and, and open it up to the floor for questions. So uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and unmute everyone. Uh, if you're in a location, potentially where there may be a lot of background noise or something like that, um, you know, please do your best to limit that if you can, but we'll go ahead and unmute folks at this time. Um, if you have the capacity to unmute yourself or, or mute yourself, you know, please do that appropriately as, as you see fit. But uh, we'll go ahead and unmute everyone and, and open the floor up for questions for uh, all of our guest speakers and uh, presenters that we've had joining us today. Hey, Robbie, this is Mike Carpenter. Uh, yes, sir, Mike. One follow-up comment to uh, Ms. Harris's question about grazing fees. I think, you know, in your particular area, you're just gonna have to call around to some people who have experience with that uh, to find out what those are. And um, after this is over, I don't wanna give out any private names without their consent, but if you'll call me after this is over, I'll share some names with you that you might be able to reach out to to, to find that answer. Thanks, Mike. We, we appreciate that. And, and I think that's some good advice. Uh, it, it definitely helps to get that local input on, on questions like that. So thank you for that comment. Uh, all right. Um, I don't see anything else new in the chat box. So we're going to go ahead and unmute everyone. Um, if you have questions, you know, we'll just try to do our best to, to not stumble upon one another and, and take one at a time. Um, but we'll go ahead and, and start with that. So uh, all right, so everyone is unmuted at this time, I believe. Um, you you may have to unmute on your end if you have questions, but uh, any questions? Hey, Robbie. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Hi, right, it's Morgan Croft. Something I didn't touch on that kind of needs to bring the light a little bit is, you know, Virginia has a lot of fall red heifers right now. Um, we have a lot of uh, association sales that uh, sponsor these bred heifer sales late in the spring like we are, and um, they're finding ways of marketing those heifers where they don't have the crowds in the, in the audience, but they're doing them online, and uh, our fall bred heifers are, they're just as high this year as they've been in the last two years. Um, you know, 1,400 to last week we had a sale there in amherst and those heifers averaged over two thousand dollars for fall bred heifers so i think the mood in virginia as far as our producers are going they're still trugging along pretty strong i mean it's it's crazy to see our fall bred heifers still selling as high as they have the last two years when we see the impacts in other places so touching back on some of the other comments we talk about making these females and pushing our heifers out you know Producers are still hunting heifers, bred heifers and bred stock. So I think holding on to these heifers, like we've talked about earlier in this session, it, it will pay off. $2,000. Thank you, Morgan. We appreciate those comments. And, and yeah, if, if folks do have fall bred heifers, uh, that, that's certainly some good advice for that. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a lot of producers around still hunting fall bred heifers. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's some sales still coming up that the associations have postponed and postponed trying to figure out this COVID-19 deal. And they've seen the success now in these online sales and the tele-auction type sales that we do here in Virginia. And uh, they're going to have some sales here in the next couple weeks that historically have been pretty hot. So, um, and it, it's just not the fall bred heifers, our bull sales, you know, the bull test that uh, Griner's part of and some of our other bull sales in the state, they've switched over and done an online deal and or a telephone deal and uh, they've been pretty successful. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, any, any other questions from the floor? Uh, any other questions for our guest speakers this morning? All right, well, I'm not hearing anyone. Um, so, so I guess you all did an excellent job uh, of putting that together. I see one, we've got one question that just popped up. Um, we have two local sales that will take place in the next two weeks, uh, Lazy Acres Angus and G&E Heifers. Um, contact Becky Roberts, uh, she's an extension agent here in Virginia for more information. So if you're in the southwestern part of the state, um, Becky will be your contact for, for those sales. Thanks, Becky, appreciate you sharing that information. All right, any other questions this morning for our speakers? Uh, yes, uh, Richard Wilkins, got one question, with the market the way it is now, uh, the VQA usually brings a premium. Is that uh, worth the inputs for that now? Well, I would say yes. Uh, when we get into the marketing season where people will be marketing fall born calves as VQA, those cattle have typically sold at a very good premium. It took a while for us to get there, for the buyers to finally pay those premiums, but we're seeing, uh, you know, 75 to as much as $100 a head premium in certain instances for those cattle, weaned, vaccinated, and preconditioned. And I will say that um, for the preconditioning programs, um, three weeks or 30 days is not enough. We thought 45 days was, but more and more, we're, we're seeing a couple groups this year move to a 60-day uh, preconditioning program to try to get those cattle as bulletproof as possible once they leave Virginia. Mike, this is Scott, can I add to that? Sure. Uh, I completely agree. And I, I guess the thing I'd say as we work with producers that that value is recognized in two ways. One you mentioned, of course, um, is potentially priced because of those calves being weaned and vaccinated, et cetera. But really where, really where it pays dividends uh, for the producers is the added weight gain. So what they need to do yeah. is sit down and figure out um, what their costs are. Uh, for that 45 plus days and their feed cost and that uh, and that cost to gain and what they're potentially going to get and in almost every scenario that that added weight pays. Yep. As long as your price that you're getting for the cattle is more than your cost of gain, put weight on them. Exactly. And I can, Scott and Mike, I'll follow up just real quick. If you look at the historic prices in Virginia, late July, August, and September are some of the high times of selling our seven, eight, and nine weight cattle in Virginia. So, you know, grass cattle are pushing hard right now, five and six weights, but uh, it's a reason why. And it's to sell these yearlings in late July, August, and September. So if you got the forage and you got the feed, make them bigger and sell them when you can hit the high spot. Right. I was on a I was on a call with uh, Dr. Curran this first thing this morning, and he made a really good point. Uh, in the times that we're in right now, uh, management strategies that add value are really important. And that's one of them. 
Yes. Thank you, Scott. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I got one quick question for, for the uh, specialists this morning. I've had some questions from uh, producers and I <laughs> typically usually market through a traditional, you know, stockyard or something like that. Um, but some of them are actually looking more to doing, you know, farm raised beef, selling locally, that type of thing. It seems like that market has really kind of exploded for some of the producers that have dabbled in that a little bit. Um, can y'all touch on that a little bit and just, you know, do, do you think that that's an avenue that producers, you know, potentially could look at that maybe have not historically done that avenue? Um, you know, just some thoughts maybe as value added or just another option. You know, I know uh, I've talked to some folks and they're saying, you know, of course, as we heard from Mike, that there's this bottleneck, you know, with the processing facilities and all right now are pretty much at capacity and, and you know, uh, moving forward as as best they can, but of course they're backed up. So just could could you touch on that subject a little bit? Oh yes, uh, mm -hmm. the bottleneck I was referring to were the national issues, but it's also here in Virginia. Um, a week ago, I had someone call me, and they had shared that some of the local processors that they had contacted were already booked up through October. So. Uh, if you do that, you need to first reserve a space at your processor to make sure you can get the animals processed. Yeah, th thanks, Mike. That's what I was hearing, you know, that I guess some folks had, had potentially looked at that avenue as maybe, you know, a, a lifeline, so to speak, in some instances. But, uh, you know, it, it sounds like that's... Um, you know, there's some, some issues there as well. Yep. All right, well, any last questions this morning for our, our guest speakers? Hey, Riley. Yes, sir, Mike. Just to sum things up, um, and this was good, this was really good. Um, go ahead and to take home I guess the take home statement from all this would be for most producers, unless you've got a specialized market, would be you sell, sell your cull cows somewhat soon if you need cash flow, uh, utilize your replacement heifers, and put everything you can, if you, everything you got, if you can, on pasture. And uh, try to sell anything you normally sell this spring, any calves, try to wait till July, late July, early August. Is that correct? You know, uh, I, I think for the most part that's correct. But you know, there's nothing there's nothing that says that these prices are going to be any better come July, <laughs> August, or September. <laughs> um, you know, the, every every bit of information that I shared is do this to extend to to lengthen the marketing window that that's available. You know, a 1,400 pound animal that's in the feedlot, you can't extend his marketing window very much. A 500 pound calf that's standing at the house, you can lengthen your marketing window a lot. I mean, essentially all the way to 1,400 pounds. Um, so as, as we start to see some of these stay at home, home orders uh, relaxed, as we start to see businesses kick back in, we start to see the economy go gain some some speed which it's not going to gain a lot of speed over three months you know it's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's more like a diesel engine than it is a gas engine our economy is it takes some time to get warmed up and go um and so there will be an adjustment period but yes overall i mean anything that you can do to lengthen that time period is going to allow uh the market to recover some I, i'm not saying it can't go lower but the likelihood of it going lower is very, very small, especially if you look at what we've seen with finished cattle prices holding really steady on a cash basis compared to where the futures market is. I think, I think this also, I think it was mentioned that this is an opportunity to, you know, strat the strategies that add value are important now, but I think strategies that protect yourself and, and from risk, because obviously we've all starting to hit so much risk now and if we weren't protecting ourselves and had strategies to protect ourselves on the risk side, we're learning that it's starting to hurt. And I would think 
let alone with management strategies, but risk strategies, I think, uh, for producers would be beneficial too moving forward, knowing that, you know, it, it can, the, the sky can fall a little bit uh, and it can hurt. Uh, so it's, uh, I think this is also opening our eyes uh, to, you know, strategy for, in terms of risk management are critical also. All right, last call for questions as we approach uh, 10 o'clock this morning. All right, well, not hearing any, uh, I I'd like to take just a few moments and, and go back through and thank all of our guest speakers this morning, both Dr. Griffith and Dr. Martinez from the University of Tennessee. We appreciate y'all joining us this morning and uh, sharing what it's like a little bit further west of us. Uh, that, that certainly helps to see what's happening in other states and, and our uh, neighboring states. We appreciate Mr. Mike Carpenter and Mr. Morgan Croft from Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, thank you for joining us and, and your in inputs this morning. Really appreciate that advice. Um, and also Dr. Scott Griner from Virginia Tech and Virginia Cooperative Extension. Thank you for joining us and, and providing that great insight. So. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us this morning. Uh, th this was an excellent event. We appreciate all the great information and updates as uh, the COVID-19 situation has, has certainly impacted the livestock industry, both at a uh, local level here in Virginia, as well as a national level across the United States. So uh, we appreciate y'all sharing some of those suggestions and insights for our producers. I know they'll find that uh, of great benefit. Um, also would like to thank all of the folks in Virginia Cooperative Extension this morning. I know we had several agents, uh, ag agents, as well as other agents from across the state. So we thank you all for joining us. Thank you for any other faculty from Virginia Cooperative Extension that may, not, may have been with us this morning to make this event possible. So just like to thank everyone that participated and, and thank you to the producers and uh, the local stakeholders that joined us this morning. We appreciate that. Um, the event has been recorded. It will be posted following this morning's session. Uh, so if you would like that recording, please contact one of your local extension agents. We'll be glad to share that out with folks. We, uh, we've been posting that on YouTube into a playlist. So you can find all of our previous VC Ag Today uh, sessions that are held every Thursday morning at nine o'clock at that link. So um, go check that out if you know some folks that may have not been able to join us for the live event this morning. So. Thanks again to everyone. We appreciate all the, uh, the great input and help this morning to make this event possible. Uh, please stay safe and, and healthy. Uh, if there's anything we can do for you here in Virginia Cooperative Extension, just let us know and uh, we'll, we'll try to help as best as we can. So thank you all again and uh, hope everyone has a great day.